Welcome to the fourth day of the 35th annual family conference held by the National MPS Society. This is the second of two days of dedicated science presentations. We are thrilled to bring you these presentations and the first session today will cover elements of Hunter syndrome, MPS2. We are pleased to be able to offer presentations from two previous and current MPS Society research grant funded laboratories. Our first presentation will be on developmental changes in the brains of zebrafish in a new MPS2 hunter zebrafish model. Our presenter will be Dr. Enrico Moro from the University of Padua in Italy. Please make sure that you are typing in your questions so that we have questions to review at the end of the session and enjoy Dr. Moro's session uh, as I'm sure you will. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. First of all, I want to thank the organizer of the National MPS Society for providing me the opportunity to keep this talk. I will first start my presentation by briefly introducing a simple but main concept. The human brain is populated by a huge number of neurons which start to develop already during the beginning of our life. A major challenging issue is how they can connect to each other to form a functional system. What we know is that they gradually build up a sort of a circuit in which information is transported across each neuronal cell to allow the well-known achievement of defined tasks, such as moving, hearing, seeing, smelling, and so on. However, to build a sophisticated circuit, neurons are required to transmit signals that allow the formation of contacts known as synapses just like inserting a plug in a socket. To form these contacts, neurons secrete factors that allow cells to extend their body and become more in touch. Once this occurs, cells then can communicate through electrical or chemical messages in the synapses. Well, we know that these signals are important. We just called them axon guidance molecules and they are released from source neurons to induce the growth of protrusions in target neurons. These protrusions are called axons and act like plugs towards the target cells, the socket. In other situations, some of them can induce also the repulsion between neuronal cells. This allows the brain to be very plastic and dynamic in our life, because connections between neurons need to be adjusted according to the need of our body, especially during our growth in infancy and childhood. Thanks to the action of these axon guidance molecules, neurons are able to establish a wiring system that relies on the formation of long protruding nerve fibers that follow a well-defined path in the central nervous system, like this. When these axon guidance molecules are defective, missorted or messed up, 
several brain defects may occur, such as the missing formation of specialized fibers that connect the two hemispheres, the two halves of the brain. Defects in these axonal guidance molecules have been associated with many diseases, including epilepsy, dyslexia, and autism, which exhibit many common symptoms with those detected in mucopolysaccharidosis type 2. Some of these guidance molecules are called with particular names. For instance, semaphorins are derived their name from the Greek word sima, meaning signal, and for meaning to carry, while natrim derives their name from the Sanskrit word netter, which means one who guides. Now, during our investigation, we thought that the loss of activity for idurinate 2 sulfatase, the enzyme implicated in mucopolysaccharidosis type 2, could negatively affect the synthesis and the activity of these guidance molecules during early development. We basically had two reasons for this assumption. First, we already demonstrated in the past that the enzyme is highly expressed during early development. And second, we reason that the products of idurnate sulfatase, known as glycosaminoglycans, are important for the function of these axon guidance molecules. This is well known in literature. So the aim of this project was to explore whether the loss of idurinate sulfatase activity could be responsible for unbalanced axonal guidance levels. And second, we want to verify whether this dysregulation of axon guidance molecules could be responsible for behavioral abnormalities. How could we do that? Well, we used a well-established animal model in our lab, which offered many advantages. This guy is called zebrafish. It's a small fish which is optically transparent, especially during its early development. And this allows to perform sophisticated light imaging, as you will see later. It has also an external fecundation so embryos can be easily manipulated and even genetically modified. And last but not the least, this fish can be used for high throughput screening of drugs. Moreover, zebrafish possess all the classical sense modalities, vision, faction, taste, tactile, balance and hearing and their brain structure and circuits are quite similar to the human ones. Here you see a scheme and the color, you see the colored parts are the common structures between human and fish in the brain. A few years ago, we were the first ones who generated the MPS2 zebrafish model. This fish exhibit many classical features of MPS2, such as big liver, big spleen, heart defects, and skeletal alterations, as you see from this image. We basically analyzed in our MPS2 fish model many brain aspects. And what we surprisingly found was that in other fish, neuronal cell protrusions, which we called axons, are not properly connecting the two halves in the brain. So the red you see here, these are the protrusions, these are the two halves, 
in hunter fish, the protrusions are not properly connecting these two halves. Interestingly, we found that in the same fish, natrium, one of these axon guidance molecules, was dysregulated, was reduced. So we attempted to understand whether these defects could be ascribed to motor behavior abnormalities. But that was not the case. We basically didn't find any difference between control in blue and uh, hunter in orange fish. We next decided to focus on the visual system. According to the type of stimulus, zebrafish respond in different ways. So, for instance, as you see from your left, when fish are uh, exposed to a small quick stimulus, this triggers neurons in the retina, that is the sensitive part of the eye and in the brain to fire, to turn on. When indeed fish are exposed to a large object which covers the field of vision, this produces a kind of switch off response in the brain. We basically used a very sophisticated but powerful system to analyze the visual response in our fish model to different stimuli. We mobilized fish, like hunter and healthy fish, and put a display, a screen, next to the fish in a lateral position. We then projected a looming dot or a moving dot in the screen and registered through a camera the brain activity in both modes. For a matter of time I won't explain the details, the technical details of this experiment. What is interesting is what we got. We found surprisingly that hunter fish exhibit a poor visual response to different stimuli. So this is the area where we registered the brain activity. These are the different dots. The dark area is the area that is like stimulated. You see in control fish there is a stimulation, in hunter fish very poor or limited stimulation. Now you will see in a short time uh, a movie showing this kind of responses. So in control fish here you see when there appeared uh, a single on the uh, two dots or three dots you will see the area that is stimulated, like it becomes whiter. So this means that the here you see the brain is responding actively, neurons are firing uh, as a consequence of this visual stimulation. Now we repeated the same stimulation with the two dots and again you will see the response of the fish. This is a control fish. So everything is fine. There we go, two dots and the response. Now, when we go to the hunter fish, the situation is different. You will see very shortly. There you see, no response. We repeat it again with two dots, but again, no response. Hold on, you will see 
no response. And neither with the three dots. Again, no response. So like, you see, no response. So hunter fish are insensitive to any visual stimulation. This is interesting because these fish exhibit in the same time dysregulation of these axonal guidance molecules that we studied. So concluding, what we found in our investigation is that hunter fish exhibit neuronal connectivity defects, which arise during early brain development. The poor response was associated with an altered communication between neurons. So, in this fish, the lack of proper connections between neurons elicit the poor visual response to stimuli. Now, if we restore the axonal guidance dependent sensitivity to these stimuli, we may improve perception in this fish, but also some cognitive abilities, because perception and cognition are tightly associated. And this would imply that we, if we correct the, uh, this axonal guidance defect, we could also uh, hypothesize to recover the cognitive function in affected patients, because we know that hunter patients exhibit many uh, issues related to the neuronal fibers connection. Before concluding, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators in my lab, so Rosa, Lorenzo, Michela, who really uh, contributed with uh, strong efforts in this project. But also I would like to acknowledge my collaborators in the university, like Rosella, like Marco, who performed uh, the study, the behavioral analysis in the, with a visual system. And, not, but, uh, and also I would like to thank the National MMPS Society for providing me the contribution, the support to perform this uh, important investigation. And of course, I would like to thank you for your attention. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Morrow, for this study and for joining us today. Our next presentation is also from a researcher working in MPS2, and he is a neuroradiologist at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Eger Nistrazel. As you may have heard in one of the clinical updates yesterday, there is incredible need for us to be able to predict phenotype in the MPS disorders that have a potential for a neuropathic disease course. One of the best options to develop that ability to predict is using MRI, and particularly a kind of MRI called diffusion tensor imaging. That will be part of Dr. Nistrazel's talk. And again, I encourage you to provide questions so that we have something that will be of interest to the audience to speak to when we get into our question and answer period. Thank you very much for joining us, and let's listen to Dr. Igor Nostrazel. Hello, MPS community, families, patients, colleagues. I'm very honored that I can give this talk, uh, although it is virtual this year. Uh, I would like to thank National MPS Society for this opportunity. And I will be talking about MPS2 Hunter syndrome and the challenges with, with the decoding the phenotypic variability in this disorder. So this is the content uh, of this talk. So I will be 
talking, talking about MPS2 types, DNA analysis, clinical phenotypes, mostly focused on the CNS disease, and then the methods about how to, how to assess the, the phenotype, the clinical manifestation of the disease. So Hunter syndrome and MPS2 is excellent recessive disorder. It is linked uh, to X chromosome and the, the gene that is mutated is, is located here. And um, this mutation links, uh, is linked to the deficiency of the enzyme that the gene encodes, and the enzyme is uh, named idronate to sulfate sulfatase, IDS, and I will be referring to IDS, either enzyme or gene later in this talk. And the enzyme is either uh, completely absent, not active at all, or there might be some residual activity. We, for the normal function, at least 10% of the activity, 10% 10, 10 or more, if it's 10% or less, so that's that that manifests as a disease. If 10% or more, then uh, the disease usually doesn't manifest. The, the MPS2 is characterized by, by, by wide clinical spectrum and wide clinical heterogeneity. So we can see the very mild phenotypes and high function individuals, and then many intermediate forms, and then very severe phenotypes that start early, can start very early in the first year of life. And then they, those children usually progress very rapidly unless are, uh, they are treated. So the symptoms, there are non-CNS symptoms and CNS symptoms and non-CNS symptoms are the, the very common are the hernia, umbilical or inguinalis, inguinal hernia, then the uh, respiratory tract infections, orthopedic prom problems as joint stiffness, dysostosis, acute pyphoscoliosis that worsens usually with age and it's worse with if there's a short stature, uh, so the kyphoscoliosis tends to be worse, hepatosplenomegaly and the cardiac and valvular disease and impaired hearing. And then there are the CNS symptoms which I will be talking a little bit more later, but those symptoms are important because when they are present, so it usually means that the phenotype, the clinical picture or the form of disease is severe. So again, I talked about the clinical heterogeneity, but there's also a genotypic variability or there are many mutations that has been identified up to this date, it was it's 671 mutations that has been recognized in MPS2. So here are some lists of some mutations. So this extreme genotype heterogeneity, a lot of new mutations. We don't know if the phenotype that is linked to this mutation will be mild or severe. So this genotype phenotype correlation are basically almost impossible. Also in mothers who are heterozygous. So, so mutations can occur, they, they occur like either the, the novel new mutations or the in mother that can be, the, she's not career, but still there may be germline mosaicism. It means that the reproductive cells, those germline and then the reproductive, the reproductive cells that are derived from these, uh, from these germ cells. So those are affected and then the offspring can be affected with the MPS2. So we know that some, based on the DNA analysis and based on the genotype, we know that if there are large gene deletions or rearrangements, so it leads to large structural alterations of the IDS enzyme, and then it's linked to the more severe clinical manifestation. Also, Small insertions and deletions, if they lead to the frame shift with introduction of premature stop codon, that the DNA uh, basically stops there and but, but should continue to you know, produce the enzyme, entire well-functioning enzyme, but it stops there. So also these are usually, usually not always, uh, linked to a severe form of the disease. And mutations on the exon nine, exon is the part that is being translated. It's not being sliced out, uh, spliced out as introns. So those are usually linked to milder form of Hunter syndrome. And point, point mutations. Point mutations is only one single nucleotide in the DNA is deleted, inserted, 
or substituted. And those are usual, those are the most common in 50 to 70 percent of IDS G mutation. Usually are missense mutations. There's one amino acid that is uh, different than from the uh, normal IDS uh, enzyme. So, so these are the most frequent and the, based on the Brazilian study, so there was no discordance among family members or MPS2 patients from different families when they have uh, the same point mutation. So usually it means that the, the, the phenotype, there was no discordance, the, the phenotype was usually either mild or, or more severe or intermediate, but, but there, they, there were minimal differences. So what would be ideal would be a transcript or expression uh, studies that would evaluate that, that IDS protein function in vitro. So we would uh, basically get the, let's say, um, uh, messenger RNA or the, the, the DNA, then express the enzyme, test it in vitro and see how it behaves. And we would be able to estimate the severity of disease. So that's, that's possibly these technologies might be available in future. So the clinical phenotypes, as I said, we talked about the genetic heterogeneity, but the same applies to phenotypic, to the clinical manifestation which heterogeneity. And this disease, we can see it as a, not as a mild, severe, probably intermediate. It's, it's a continuum with different forms ranging from mild to severe. Uh, the kids usually they get born normal and they develop somatic signs between two to four years of age, the ones with the severe form. With the milder form, it varies quite a bit. But what's important is the CNS phenotype. So with neuro neuropsychological assessments, we can assess different aspects of cognition or behavior. So we can distinguish these, these phenotypes, plus neurological assessments, we can see other symptoms. So for the mild disease, we know there's attention span problem, memory, especially visual memory issues, visual motor skills, spatial ability, executive functioning, executive functioning is within normal. Whereas in severe form, it's, which is more often, three to four times more often than attenuated or mild form, or non-neuropathic. So we see in severe form, we see cognitive and behavioral symptoms and sleep disturbances within the first year of life. Very, this is, these problems uh, are very challenging for the child, but also special or also, or especially I would say for parents and caregivers uh, the, the children are, they have low attention span, they are high energy, very early in life, aggressive to people or to, to, to objects. Um, and that's, that's very challenging and affects quality of life of the kid, but as I said, care of caregivers and parents. Hyperality and perseverative chewing, things that we that are not, not specific for MPS2, we also see these in MPS3A, for example, and seizures that can occur later in life. So how can we, besides the neuropsychological assessments, how can we assess the variability in, in phenotype or brain phenotype, the CNS variability, with methods that potentially can predict the worsening of the neuropsych neuropsychological uh, uh, measures. So one possibility is to look at the brain with MRI. So we know that the brain atrophy, enlarged ventricles or extreme form hydrocephalus or white matter lesions like uh, corpus callosum uh, atrophy or, or white matter hyperintensities or enlarged spaces around vessels, so enlarged prevascular spaces or also an overhoprobin, they are typical findings in MPS across all MPS types, but in MPS2, of course, as well. And they differ between mild and severe disease in a way, but how can we measure them quantitatively? Here, just for illustration, different uh, pictures of MRI. So here we see the T1, which is 
more like anatomy. You see gray matter is gray, white is white, and the cerebrospinal fluid and ventricles here is dark. Here, there are the enlarged spaces around vessels, enlarged perivascular spaces. This is the same picture from the same subject, but with a different, uh, different sequence, different, mod different modalities, T2-weighted sequence, where the CSF in the ventricles or around the brain is uh, bright. And you can see also the, the enlarged spaces along vessels are bright here. And you can see some white matter disease but here there's another sequence which is uh, called flare, fluid attenuated, that the fluid, the CSF is attenuated. So you see ventricles and the area around the brain is dark. And nicely, what is, what is good for body sequence, you can, you can read uh, the extent of the white matter disease, which is shown here. Here on, on, this, uh, on, on this one, I, see no, I show normal uh, flare, mild or to moderate uh, white matter disease here, as you see like this white uh, uh, patches, and then then a severe that you see around the ventricles, this should be like dark as here. So uh, I'm sorry. So here it's like, like these confluent lesions. Surprisingly, the Verhoeven spaces that we that cheesy appearance of the brain that we see a lot in in MPS patients, uh, not only MPS two, so they like they very likely are not related to cognitive functioning or behavior. So we see, for example, this eight year old boy. He has a lot of these spaces in the white matter here. You see it here. You see it here in the corpus callosum, but. He was well functioning, his IQ was high, so not really related to the cognitive uh, function here. So how can we measure and assess these changes in the brain with continuous variable, with, with numbers uh, that are continuous with quantitative outcomes? So we can do look at the brain volumetry uh, and measure the gray matter abnormality, um, was the brain atrophy, we can measure the brain volume, cortical thickness in different regions using this automated automated um, segmentation of the brain. Here it's shown in the infant with the, with the same methodology, basically it's one of the techniques we just mastered in, in, in past two years. So we are like newborns, we are ready for assessing the newborns here. And so we can measure the atrophy. Storage material, is there increase in size or not? That's, that's a question. We've seen something like that in MPS2 boys with attenuated form. And cognitive decline and memorials, memorials, they are considered to be related to the, to the atrophy or to the changes in volume to ventricular megaly. So this is one of the methodologies that we can use. And we did indeed we use that in assessing the attenuated MPS2 boys. And we see in neuropsychological measures that the IQ and memory were average, but the attention was one standard deviation below. Corpus callosum was smaller by 22% compared to age match controls. And uh, the normal age related white matter increases because the white matter usually is getting bigger over time in the brain, the, the volume of it. So they were not seen as we, as we compare them to the controls. And the somatos somatic disease burden and white matter and corpus callosum were interrelated. So the somatic disease and the brain phenotype, they, uh, I, I wouldn't, so there was association in the severity, which is interesting finding. And we see that also in APS1. So this is just to show that the blacks are control, red are MPS2. So we see that the volumes that are on the Y axis here, the volumes are higher uh, than in, uh, in MPS2. So another method that we can look at the white matter disease is diffusion imaging. So it's another modality, not like the T1 I showed you anatomical, T2 or flare, it's a different way to look at the brain. And with this type of imaging, we are basically evaluating the water molecules in the brain and how they behave. So if there's if the brain is well myelinated, there's myelin in the white matter that is, uh, that is uh, not affected by any disease and the axons are not affected by any disease. So myelin being hydrophobic, uh, 
an axon just restricting the motion. So the, the motion of the water is in longitudinal axis. And so, so and we can measure that it, it, it behaves well. Here, I just want to show you that the brain actually, it's, it's like any image bunch of pixels. And for each of them, we can actually see how the water molecule uh, move. So here in this blue one, you, you see that there's a little vector. So this is the direction where, where it, it moves and we can measure, uh, we can basically measure that. And that uh, shows us what is the uh, white matter integrity it, you know if it's if it's affected or not so it's one it's another measure of structure brain structure that we can we can get we can get quanti uh, this you know quantitative measures and assess the structure the hypothesis is that it will be similar as nps1 that the white matter structure will be affected here and of course we do have some preliminary data that we'll publish pretty soon and it'll, it'll show that, that there's uh, the white matter is, is affected in this, this disorder. Cervical spine abnormalities, they're more typical for other disorders than MPS2, but they are also in MPS2. We looked at MPS1, that here's a patient that they are, like you see, there is a narrowing here at the junction between, between uh, the head, occipital, uh, cervical, and, and the neck cervical junction. And it affects the spinal cord. It can affect the spinal cord that it can has the functional sacrilege. And this is something we are able to measure before they have clinical uh, manifestation. So we we have a, we had a recent paper that we showed in patients with degenerative cervical myelopathy. So we can measure the changes in the spinal cord before they clinically manifest. And that's the same thing that we want to measure things before in the brain, before they come to manifest. It's something similar we want to show in uh, MPS. So here, this is basically, you see the blue means that the tracks, they go uh, from up to down or down to up. It's the directionality. And here we can also look at the different uh, uh, routes coming from spinal cord. And this is a picture from, from the paper. Uh, so we can basically do the volumetry here, measure the gray and white matter, which is shown here. And then we can also look at the white matter integrity with the diffusion techniques, which is, which is shown here. And we can look at different tracks as well. <clears throat> so it's something that we, we are focusing in the lab and there will be more, more uh, publications to come on this topic. So EEG and other electrophysiology. So there are not many studies. We know about epilepsy that is between 13 to 34% present. Uh, there was one interesting study from uh, 1974 from Israeli group. Where they looked at two siblings with nyctalopia, which is inability to see in the dim light or at night. And they found some changes in the electroretinography, which is like uh, measuring the signals from uh, retina, electric signals from retina. And it's probably due to retinal, uh, like a little something of like an accumulation. EEG, there's this one study uh, from Mexican group. So there, there was a low amplitude during sleep and asymmetry of background activity. So there was a sort of case report study but we, there are new techniques how to assess AEG background activity. So here we see there's a change. You see the arrows, they show the change in the, in the AEG uh, frequency, uh, sort of slowing here and, and amplitude, amplitude increase, uh, the same here. And we can actually measure the, the EEG frequency and be shown in a different disease. It's uh, asymptomatic virus in infants. These are 12 months infants. So here we see that there is the, the, the blue is normal, but then the, the red me, the red is the asymptomatic kids with CMV. So they drop the, the frequency drop in this, uh, in this uh, frequency um, range. So, and again, like it's probably related to, to overall cognitive function. So bio, biochemical and immunological markers. So we can measure the glycosaminoglycans in serum, urine, and CSF. Dye binding methods are non-specific, so there's mass spectro spectrometry with liquid chromatography or with tandem uh, mass uh, spectro uh, spectrometry, 
and they can specifically measure the dermatin sulfate, heparin sulfate, keratin sulfate, or chondroitin sulfate. These, they were shown to be increasing in PS2, but they didn't distinguish between it was like it was they distinguished between treated and untreated uh, MPS2 with bone or with uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, but they didn't show the difference between severe and mild. Uh, another possibility is to look at the immune mediators, like dif di different uh, immunological markers that are usually pro inflammatory. And, and we know there's a brain inflammation, mild brain inflammation going on in the MPS brains. So you can measure that, but then again, this is more like for groups, for comparing group groups, but uh, for individual decision making process, it's it's not that effective. And now, newborn screening and the near future. So newborn screening is being done in some states. It's uh, it's done from the dry blood spot, and it measures the IDS activity. If it's then less or equal to ten percent, so it's uh, positive. In Illinois, they measured this number of kids. It's the paper of, uh, by Barbara Burton from 2020, and they tested basically three were positive from the from 300,000, uh, 300, so about uh, one in 110,000 uh, infants uh, was positive. There was pseudo efficiency, the pseudo deficiency, which is a which is a, a little complications and can be then basically what it implies that another test uh, should be done for the for the GAC positivity. And, and these kids basically showed that there, there was no uh, dry, dry blood spot GACs or no GAC uh, no GACs in the urine. But again, like this is this is we'll see what if these sort of deficiency kids will be later on, uh, they will have automated disease or no disease at all. It's it's a it's a question. Uh, the Japan, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan, and South Korea, they are also doing the newborn screening. And what about the future? So the future, I would say, is bright for the MPS in general, but also MPS2, because there are a lot of clinical trials now ongoing, and they're promising with the gene, different gene therapies or gene editing. Uh, or there are also a lot of uh, drugs in the preclinical development. So I hope, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful there will be some uh, treatment coming, coming, but then what's important is like to be able to, to identify the severity because we cannot, because we are not able to do genotype, uh, phenotype correlation to, to, to have some measures that we can identify or tell early in life and start uh, and accordingly start the treatment early in life to the fact that we will be having, we will have some measures that are sensitive to the, to the disease for MPS2. And that is all. So I'm a little bit over. I apologize for that. Thank you for your attention. Again, thank you, National Empty Society, for this opportunity. I wish you uh, the, the best and uh, enjoy the meeting. And I will be happy to take any questions uh, during online. Thank you. Thank you, Enrico and Igor, for your presentations. Those were both excellent. And we have a couple of good questions to get us uh, started off with. Uh, one relates to uh, Dr. Enrico's presentation about axonal guidance. Assuming something was uh, changeable, could we potentially find drugs that could correct a axonal guidance defect if we can uh, demonstrate that something similar is happening during uh, uh, development in infants and children? Oh, yes. The answer is yes. I think uh, we are uh, actually exploring the heparin sulfate, the, the substrate that it is accumulating. This heparin sulfate is an important factor in the activity of these axon guidance molecules. So. Uh, 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 we can uh, target this uh, kind of molecule to uh, not only from the enzymatic activity, but also we can target its direct um, possibility to uh, modulate this axon guidance molecule function to improve either the uh, synthesis of this uh, axon guidance molecules, but also the action, because uh, downstream of these axon guidance molecules, there is a kind of pathway in, inside the cell, 
the neuronal cells that triggers the response, for instance, to neurotransmitters. So we can really modulate those axon guidance molecules and affect the uh, neurotransmitter activity, but also improve the connection between neuronal cells. I'm wrong, but you would also have the ability to test potential drug targets using zebrafish embryos to see whether they affect or change axon guidance. And also, uh, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you can do in vitro studies where you will have sort of two sources of axon cues and you you puff them in fluid in front of a, a growing axon and you can see in, in film uh, 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 development or live imaging of the cells where the axons go. So there are a lot of interesting techniques you could use, I think. Absolutely correct. I mean, we actually are raising uh, a novel MPS2 in vitro model using a mesencephalic cell line. This uh, uh, is basically will be used to, to, to assess this abilities in growing axis towards neuronal cells. I mean, we can work both in vitro and in vivo together. So this also ties in a little bit to uh, uh, Dr. Nestrasel's approach to identifying uh, white matter and white matter changes. I noticed that there was some changes in the corpus callosum and Dr. Enrico's study also shows developmental changes there. I think it's unclear in the MPSs whether any changes we see in corpus callosum are a developmental change or whether they are a degenerative change or, and the answer is probably a combination of both. But given the long period of human brain plasticity, I would imagine that we have a window of a couple of years during development to potentially intervene in any particular case. Do you think that imaging studies would have the ability to identify that sort of change, Igor, in axonal outgrowth, et cetera? So we can measure the axons with uh, those diffusion, different diffusion techniques, like the DTI model is one of them, as I said in the presentation. The question is, because there are so many things going on in the first two years of life during the, during the development that are you know, <clears throat> that are basically is the pruning and is the is the myelination and so many so many changes and so it's really hard to to tell during that those first two years and we need those studies. We need to know like if if you know if there is any deviation and there is all, of course there's also a lot of variability. But anyway, the, these techniques they can they can help us if we will have uh, patients who are with MPS to have healthy controls and see the deviation in this early stage, you know, in the kids who are diagnosed during the newborn screening. So, so that would be really ideal to, 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 uh, sort of get a better idea, still not decisive idea about developmental versus, you know, uh, <clears throat> versus like it is there from, you know, from birth. So th these techniques would, would help us uh, at least like to describe what's going on, you know, on the axonal level or the myel you know, at the, at, on the level of myelination. And corpus callosum is a good target in humans or even in, in uh, some animal, animal models because it's like a really the, 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 the biggest white matter structure in the brain. So, so we like to look at the corpus callosum, and again, like we'll see, yeah, we'll see in, in you know in the future studies. What we'll, 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 once we have uh, some of the kids identified in our screening, so we'll, we'll look at it and compare to to, to uh, normally developing babies. So newborn screening is going to really change the the population of uh, patients that we see and getting uh, important imaging data to define their course of disease, I think, is going to be really important to better understanding and also better treating their disease, I would guess. We had one question about axon guidance and the newborn period and whether we can intervene. And I'm going to give my 30,000 mile uh, above the earth answer, but I'll open it up to you. And my sense is that 
we know there's a period after which we can't intervene meaningfully to fully correct uh, central nervous system defects. We've known that in MPS1 for decades now, uh, that if you bone marrow transplant too late in a hurler child, you're not going to get optimal response. So my question would be, or my answer would be, there is a period after which we may not be able to intervene. How much of that is part of axonal guidance versus other aspects of brain maturation, I can't say. But I also think the brain is highly plastic, uh, as the neuroscientists say. So there is a lot of hope to develop, develop areas of treatment. I know even for serious cognitive disorders like Fragile X, they've just come up with a drug therapy. I'm going to open it up to you, too. If I can give my opinion, I absolutely agree with the fact that uh, the, the brain is highly plastic. Uh, we know for, for long decades that we, we provide, for instance, neuro, near nerve growth factor or other growth factors. You can improve the connections to between neurons. So uh, the question is how much you can correct. This is a good question. But I'm, I think that uh, basically we can improve. If we cannot start so early, we can improve later on this connection and increase the potential ability to connect neurons between each other. This is something that is also, you know, peculiar in other disorders. I mean, we, if we think about like brain infarcts or brain uh, uh, stroke, we know that some uh, molecules can improve and recover much, much more easily the function of the brain itself. So I think it, it could be, the, you know, we can correct sooner or later. I don't know, Igor, if you agree with that. I do, I do, I do agree, Enrico. And ex exactly as you mentioned, those two, two, those examples of brain stroke. So then we know that the kids, when they get the brain stroke very early in life, so they they still, uh, even non-treated, you can still see that they, you know, they are able to overcome that deficit, that you, that deficit they would expect in adults. So they are able to overcome it. So even if it, there is like almost, you know, big. Uh, part of the brain in one hemisphere is missing. They are, they don't have, they are not hemiplegic. They are able to overcome. So there is a, you know, we know about this plasticity. And, you know, those first two years of life for the brain development are critical. Of course, there is, the brain development is ongoing until, until 20s. But then the first two years are critical. And I think if the intervention comes within those first two years, uh, I would expect uh, favorable out outcomes in these children. Thank you. I have two quick uh, last questions before we wrap up. Uh, Igor, there was a question on the uh, netrin. Do you think it's a problem of release or expression or both? It's for, for me? Uh, and Rico. Ah, okay. Yes, for me, because for I was like, <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay, the, the question is, we, uh, I'm pretty sure, because we are also working on the receptor, so natrine is this molecule outside of the cell, but there is a, a receptor that is uh, capturing these molecules. We have uh, an imbalance in both natrine and its receptor. This is called DCC. Okay, so what, we, what I thought, what I, what I found is that natrine is... Uh, downregulated, is is um, receptor is upregulated to you know compensate, but it's for some reasons it's not properly exposed to the surface of the cells. So there is kind of block in the circuit that is driven by these two molecules that connect to each other, and this is a problem that it might be re uh, also related to the action of the sulfate because we don't have accumulation. I don't see any accumulation, but I can see like mis-expression, mislocalized diffusion of heparin sulfate. So it might be uh, also dependent on the diffusion of the ligand, nitrine, in the, in the brain itself. But I'm oh, really... So, so, and we could also have a problem both with the lysosomal transport and the membrane That's transport right. of both of those right. down the axon. So, uh, right. And we know transport's interfered. One last question uh, that doesn't really uh, apply to 
either of you particularly, there's a question about why can't we use GAGs as a primary outcome measure in clinical trials? We would love to use a biomarker. GAGs may not be predictive of a full clinical response. So if you have a patient who is beyond a window of therapeutic opportunity, say for central nervous system disease, all the GAG will be telling you is that the enzyme is functioning and decreasing the substrate. It won't tell you about the cognitive abilities in that patient. So um, it would be good to be able to use that as a support, but we also have to go with clinical data. We're at time, gentlemen. I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we really appreciate it. Your talks will be available for 30 days on the platform, and then we'll go on to uh, the YouTube channel. So you, you will be immortalized there. Thank you again so much for your time today. Thank you very thank much. You. I really appreciate it. Have a great day, too. Likewise. Thank you Thank so you, much. Matthew.